when you tell people that you're a David Cassidy fan and the impact he had on your life and on your career specifically, mm-hmm. what type of reaction do you get? At different stages in my life, I got different reactions, right? So I'll start with when I was a kid growing up in Houston. Uh, my neighbor across the street, Janine, so I would have been about seven. Janine was probably 13. And she was like the ringleader of our neighborhood. Um, so there was me, Janine, my sister, Jenny, my sister's best friend, Barb, my best friend, Charlotte, and a woman named Jane. Well, not a woman, a, another teenager named Jane and another teenager named Kathy. And we would put on performances of the Partridge family in the backyard, Janine's backyard, for our moms. And we would actually make tickets and sell them tickets for like a quarter each. And we would have a concession stand where our moms made popcorn and then we put it out there pretending like we were selling it, right? And then we would take the stereo outside and put the record on of the Partridge family. And I always got to be Chris, the drummer, which was very exciting because Janine always got to be David Cassidy, which was the plum position, right? Everybody wanted to be David. Um, Nobody wanted to be Shirley, nothing against Shirley Jones, but she was the oldest. Nobody wanted to be Reuben Kincaid, although one of the little boys in our neighborhood was Reuben and it was pretty funny. I think he would actually put on a little suit and stuff. And um, I think my sister played tambourine. Um, Maybe Kathy played Lori Partridge because she looked a lot like Lori Partridge. I loved it. And we would play along to the record even if we didn't know how to play the instruments we were really into it we're singing and we would make enough money that we could all get on our bikes afterwards and ride our bikes to Dairy Queen and get ice cream cones and that was like I felt like a real rock and roll star right we had to learn the songs we performed the songs we got paid for the songs then we got to go and treat ourselves so to me David Cassidy was like a win-win right you can't (laughs) the songs were great his voice is great. Yeah, I mean, he had, you can tell it's David, too. You yeah. know, that's, nobody sounded like him. I definitely think my first guitar was because of David Cassidy. I have no doubt. Because really? I, I think I got my first one at six. And my mom had had me doing piano lessons. And my piano teacher looked like Marge Simpson. She just had this, she didn't have <laughs> blue hair, but she had this really tall beehive. And my lesson was in this little concrete room. And I would go in there. She was not, she wasn't, hey, hey, Sarah, it's time to play the piano. She wasn't like fun. She was like a taskmaster and she had this crazy hair and I was just terrified of her. So I told my mom, I don't, I don't want to take piano lessons. My mom was like, why not? I was like, I couldn't tell her because I didn't know who Marge Simpson was yet. Right. I was just like, I don't know. She's freaky. So my mom took me to the music store and I saw the guitars and I was like, I want what David has. I want a guitar, Yeah, you know, and I still have that guitar watching the Partridge family and you know, looking and seeing what chords he was playing and then playing them on the guitar and learning their songs and, you know, back then 45 records or the whole albums and putting them on, dropping the needle, listening, 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 practicing, practicing, practicing. It was exciting, you know, because you felt, I felt close to David. Like I felt like I was in the band with him I, or he was teaching me stuff. I don't think there's anything greater than finding your first heroes and they impress on you and, and alter your life forever because now they're inside you in a really sweet way, you know, in an inspiring way. I don't think there's a greater gift that you can give people than to inspire them to be more of who they are or who they're meant to be or, or giving them a dream to become. I think that's amazing. What a gift. You know, he gave me. Yeah. So that that's what started it. Um, in fact, the first album I ever got in my whole life was a Partridge Family album followed by a Three Dog Night album, Golden Biscuit, which I also loved. My dad brought home one day as a surprise a David Cassidy album, of just of David Cassidy, and I was, you know, because there wasn't the internet back then. You didn't, yeah. you didn't really know about things, especially as a kid. So I would have been, you know, like I said, seven or eight. And he came home and he had this brown paper bag and he pulled it out of the bag and I was, there was David Cassidy and I was like, <gasps> you know, ran upstairs, took the cellophane off. And so, yes, David Cassidy, as a kid, nobody was surprised because we all loved the Partridge family back then, right? In fact, on Friday nights in Houston, Texas, growing up, we would watch the Brady Bunch, then the Partridge family, then the Mary Tyler Moore show, then the Bob Newhart show. Then I got to go see David Cassidy perform in concert. And uh, I could not even believe it. My mom put us all in the station wagon. We went downtown Houston somewhere. I don't, it was a big venue. I'd, of course, never been there. Front row, dead center tickets. So I was sitting right in the middle 
out comes the band, then out comes David Cassidy, and he's in this white jumpsuit, kind of Elvisy. It had fringe on the arms, and it had a, you know, like a, uh, I don't know what you call that, when it like ties up the front. It was quite sexy for me at seven or eight or whatever. <laughs> and I think he might even have had white boots on. And he came out jumping around and singing, and I was just like, my mouth fell open. And I couldn't believe I was like 20 feet from him. And it was all little girls, right? We were all like, ah! You know, I just, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I didn't get to meet him and I didn't get his autograph, but it, I, it felt like I was just in the palm of his hand the whole time anyway. So I was really happy. At that show, I got this huge David Cassidy poster. So huge. I wish I still had it. It was probably, you know, four feet by two feet or four feet by three feet. And it was on my wall for a long time. And then in junior high, sadly, you know, the Partridge family kind of fell out of favor, much like in the United States, um, girls and Girl Scouts, once they get to high school, they're not really digging Girl Scouts anymore, which is too bad. But um, so it was kind of uncool for a little bit, not to like David Cassidy. And then I got to high school and I went to a high school for performing and visual arts. It wasn't a snooty school. I mean, people... People weren't snarky or mean back then. Um, people were very supportive of whatever you liked, you know. So most of the kids I was hanging around with were into Led Zeppelin, and I was starting to get into Heart because it had two female leads, and I really loved that. And Nancy Wilson played guitar, and I played guitar. But I would play Partridge Family songs, and nobody would laugh at me. You know, they would they would join in, or they would want to know the chords, you know. And then I went to college, and it was fine there, too. Nobody made fun of me. And then I graduated from college, and I'd been playing music. Uh, I started when I was about six or seven, and I won my first award when I was six or seven in a talent show at school. And then I just kept winning these talent shows, playing the guitar and singing songs I wrote. But when I moved to Dallas, after I graduated from the University of North Texas in Denton, Texas, there was a radio station. It's still there, um, K-E-R-A. Great station. It's now a talk radio station, but when I was there, it was all music all the time, and they supported a lot of local musicians. So they were the first people to play a song from my album before I even got picked up on a major label, which would have been in 1988, and that was highly unusual. Um, it was before the whole DIY thing started in the 90s. I was ahead of the game. I put together an album by myself and put it out myself. Because of that, KERA played one of my songs. It was a song for my father. And I pulled my car over. I heard it coming up on the radio. And I pulled my car over and I just cried and cried. I couldn't believe I was on the radio. Then KERA calls up and says, hey, we're doing a compilation uh, recording. And we're asking all these local musicians to do a cover song. So I said, I want to do I Think I Love You by the Partridge Family. And they went, okay, cool. And so my friend Josh Allen, who's an amazing musician, guitarist, he produced it. Uh, my boyfriend at the time, Marty Lester, was the engineer. And the band that played on it with me uh, was called Spot, formerly Mildred. A bunch of really talented young men. We recorded it in an afternoon. And Josh had this hilarious idea. Sorry, you can see how hot it is here. I'm sweating. And I'm in my house. It's a lot. Um, Josh said, okay, at the end of the song... He's from New York. At the end of the song, I think you should maybe uh, say, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And I was like, what? Why would I do that? That's No, that's sacrilegious. I can't do that. And he's like, yes, do it, do it, do it. So we did it. And then the very last part goes into this kind of elongated retard. So I'm going, I hate you, I hate you, I hate And we have all these harmonies. And then the very last thing is we go, I love you. So it kind of had this hilarious little ending to it, which to this day, I'm still glad he made us do that because it is really funny and unexpected. And it's a very different version from the Partridge Family's version. Yeah. But the rest of it's very true to form. And I always, man, the people that wrote the songs for the Partridge Family are so talented, really I just, their songs to this day are still really catchy. Um, I have a friend named Jim Stevens who just, has been recording different Partridge Family songs because he loves them too and putting them out on his own albums and he does beautiful renditions. So, you know, if you love the Partridge Family as a kid, especially David Cassidy, he never goes out of favor. I was really sad when he died because I was so sure I was going to meet him. I went on a date with Mickey Dolenz from the Monkees in LA who played the drums for the Monkees yes. and I kept getting closer to David Cassidy and we would be on the same radio station but at different times. I even have a recording he did that I can put on my phone message 
that says, hey, uh, this is David Cassidy, and uh, can't get to the phone right now, but, you know, it was like, ah, I would put that on. I still have it, and sometimes I put it on, and people freak out when they call, like, how did you get David Cassidy to record that? But, no, I sadly did not get to meet him in person. I just wanted to go back to what you were saying about your version of I Think I Love You, and I was surprised when it was I Hate You, I Hate You, and I was like, why is she doing that? But... I think it's a superb tribute to his legacy. Thank you. I I do too. I hope that he heard it. I don't know if he did, but uh, I'm sure he got inundated with people covering his stuff. But I did get to meet Tony Romeo. I was in the recording studio in Los Angeles at this place that's defunct, but it was called Power Tracks. And Tony Romeo was coming in because I don't know if he was coming to meet uh, somebody there at the studio, but... He walked in into the main um, section of the studio and I was out there talking to a drummer or something. And he walked in and I said, oh, hi, I'm Sarah. And he said, hey, I'm Tony. Tony. And I said, oh, what, what's your last name? He said, Tony Romeo. And I went, oh, I know who you are. I love your music. Oh, my God, you're so talented. And he like, he couldn't believe, he was like, you know who I am? I was like, of course I know who you are. I can't even believe I'm getting to meet you. And this was before cell phones because I certainly would have done like 20 selfies with him. But I was like, I said, can I hug you? He's like, sure. And I was hugging him. And I was like, thank you for your gift of music. And I just love everything. you. He And he and his brothers had a band for a while called the Romeo. Was it called Romeo's? The Romeo Brothers or the Romeos. But anyway, they had that song called... Um, is it I Can Hear Your Heartbeat? They did a song that the Partridge Family covered. But anyway, I had their 45 single. So I so I got kind of close to David. <laughs> that is a superb story. Thank yeah. you. The songs that Tony Romeo wrote, and I was talking to someone the other day about it. You know, they said, well, because of him, they became a songwriter. Yeah. His inspiration on his He's lyrics. very, I, I don't think, I certainly don't think, you know, my very first influence again was the Partridge family followed by the Carpenters followed by John Denver um I thought all three of those had just profoundly beautiful songs very catchy songs so they definitely all influenced me but uh definitely the Partridge family (laughs) influenced me first did you ever find as your career evolved that certain aspects of Partridge family music came through in your work that's a really good question. I do believe. Um, are you a songwriter? Oh no. Oh, okay. I'm not. A well, I always like I'm to ask. I'm fascinated how people like you can write a song. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of fascinated by it too, and I've been doing it uh, 52 years. When you're a songwriter, you know, I don't know about other songwriters, but I'm going to guess this is pretty true of most of them. There's different ways songs come about. At least for me, uh, sometimes I do what's called spurt writing which means all of a sudden I have this idea and the song is all there. It's almost all complete. Um, And then I, and then I have the song. I even know what the chords are going to be, blah, blah, blah. Then the second kind I have is dream writing where I'm in a dream while I'm asleep and I can see myself on stage. I'm on stage. I'm singing this song. And then I wake up really quick and I write it down. And then the third way is co-writing, you know, with other people and making time, sitting down with someone, coming up with concepts. Now, uh, there's times when I write a song and I swear it sounds like a song somebody else has already written. So then I do searches, you know, like, because I'm thinking, did I just psychologically not realize this is someone else's song and I'm reinterpreting it? And of course, all songs are from other songs. There's just no way you can escape it. But um, I definitely know that... uh, There are tidbits like I don't think um, I don't think my choruses would have been as catchy. And I definitely think bridges are a part where sometimes I think that those are reflections from my love of the Partridge family, the chord progressions or the way I put words together. Um, And most people think I'm kind of a quirky songwriter, which is fine with me. I'd rather be quirky than just be normal and ordinary. But um, I definitely think um, being engaged as a young person and recreating the Partridge Family music left an indelible mark on how I approach songwriting, um, whether I'm aware of it or not. But as far as having something where I think, oh, this is definitely from Albuquerque or one of their other songs, I don't know that that's happened. But now that you've said that, I'm going to start. <laughs> I'm going to start paying attention when I'm performing and listening to my music and thinking oh my gosh, that's from that song, blah, 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 you know, because that they might be there and I'm not paying attention to it. Yeah, because you've written some songs. I remember once there was an interview I read where you wrote a love letter to your insomnia. 
Yes, I But did. you've also and written about other personal s- subjects yes. as well. I wonder if you find songwriting a form of therapy for you. You know, uh, I would say that, yes. I would, I, well, I would say I'm very transparent. I think the reason most people, if I may say, enjoy me or like me is because I'm pretty much the same person on stage as I am talking to you. I, I don't put on a persona and I talk openly about things that are important to me, whether it's my insomnia, which I've had for 30 years now. And um, the reason I wrote that song, which is called To a Maddening Ghost, is because I was about seven years into my insomnia and I thought maybe if I write a 